Most of the asteroids in the solar system are located between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, so many of them there that we give the name asteroid belt to this region of the solar system. And so we have all these asteroids out here in the asteroid belt. And if you look here, you'll notice that we got all, all those green dots. Those are asteroids whose orbits keep them in the asteroid belt. The red dots are asteroids that are asteroid belt asteroids whose orbits are very elliptical and will actually cross the orbit of the inner planets. So those are potential impactors. But I also want you to look at a couple other interesting things. And, and, and that are, are these chunks of asteroids right here that are in the same orbit as Jupiter. So Jupiter is right there. And so as Jupiter goes around the sun, then some of these are, are, some of these are, are in front of Jupiter and some of them are behind Jupiter. Okay. So here, this is what most people envision when they think asteroid belt. Millennium Falcon squeezing its way amongst all these asteroids and meteoroids trying to avoid getting smashed to bits by them. I've seen I don't know how many sci-fi shows and uh, movies uh, uh, that, that depict an asteroid belt in this fashion. And I admit when I think asteroid belt, um, at some level I kind of think this, though intellectually I know it is entirely wrong. In reality, the asteroids are so far away from each other, even though there's millions of asteroids in the asteroid belt, uh, it's so big that they're, they're so far away from each other that if you're standing on an asteroid in the asteroid belt, the nearest other asteroid is in all likelihood so far away it's not even visible to your naked eye. And so that means there's no chance of actually running into things. Uh, but still, this is the picture a lot of people have an asteroid belt. Even scientists think this. When they sent the uh, Voyager spacecraft out to Jupiter and Saturn and the outer solar system, they were big, expensive spacecraft, and they were unwilling to risk them going through the asteroid belt until they sent two little cheap pioneer spacecraft first that went through to make sure that nothing would run into them and, and block them from getting through the asteroid belt. That was actually a serious concern, is there might be so much stuff in the asteroid belt that we didn't see that you couldn't actually navigate through it. And that turned out to be totally unfounded. So back here, uh, uh, we got the asteroid belt, and even though it's, it's filled with asteroids, as I said, you know, the, the diagram here is not really fair. The dots are way too big on the diagram to actually illustrate the space between the asteroids. But you've got to do that. Otherwise, if the dots were actual size, you would not be able to see anything on your computer screen. But again, up here, we got Jupiter. Okay, we got Jupiter up here. Okay, so we got Jupiter up here, and we've got over here, we've got... Uh, um, these two groups of asteroids in front and behind Jupiter. So what's going on with them? Well, it turns out that a mathematician by the name of Lagrange worked out the mathematics of these orbits here and said, okay, we know that if that as Jupiter goes around the sun, uh, if you have an asteroid or something that's near this spot, 60 degrees in front of Jupiter, if it's, if it's up here, that orbit is going too slow. And so that means that Jupiter starts catching up with it. And so that means it gets closer to Jupiter. Then Jupiter's gravity pulls on it, slows it down. And when it slows down even more, it falls closer to the sun. And when it gets closer to the sun, it starts speeding up. Well, as it gets up here, Jupiter's gravity pulls on it, slows it down, and it goes back. And so asteroids up here will just make little loops around that point. And likewise, they'll just make little loops around this point 60 degrees behind. We call these Lagrange points. There's a couple other Lagrange points out there. They're like L3 and L4. Uh, there's a couple other Lagrange points. You could have one spot right between Jupiter and the sun where Jupiter's gravity and the sun's gravity balance and it stays at that point. Okay, and there's another Lagrange point further out. Uh, but those are unstable Lagrange points. The, the 60 degree in front and 60 degree in back are stable. So that means things just wander around there. So, so the very first of these asteroids that were found in this orbit were named after characters from the Iliad. 
Well, you remember the Iliad is about the Trojan War. It's the, 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 the epic uh, saga by uh, Homer uh, that is about the, the uh, Trojan War. And so uh, the, the, uh, the asteroids in front of Jupiter were all named after Trojans in the Trojan and the Iliad. And the ones behind were always na all named after Greeks from the Iliad. And so that means the Greeks for all eternity are chasing the Trojans around the sky, which is very fitting if you've read the Iliad. Well, Jupiter is not the only thing that has something like this. Here we have Earth and another asteroid called Kruithni. Uh, so if you look at them here, it looks like, well, Earth and Kruithni have this weird orbit. Uh, Kruithni keeps crossing the orbit of the Earth, and so that makes it you know, look like a potential uh, Earth impactor. But it, it, it doesn't really work that way. Okay, so yeah, and then you might ask, well, wait a minute, I thought Earth was going to clear its orbit. Okay, so what happened with this? Well, if we change our perspective, instead we look at it from this perspective, in which you're looking at Earth right here, and the whole sky is shifting around, and so the Earth and the Sun look like they're stationary, okay, what happens is as Kruithni is going around its orbit here, it looks like it is circling around a spot that is 60 degrees in front of Earth's orbit. Yes, that's a Trojan point right there. So it's always circling around 60 degrees in front of Earth's orbit. And so on the right over there, you see what a Trojan orbit kind of looks like, really. And, and so, uh, on, uh, uh, so that's, or on the left, right, that's what it really looks like. And on the right is what it appears to look like, always 60 degrees in front. Okay. And so there we have this, this uh, uh, orbit right there. So that, that is very similar to what happened with Jupiter. Uh, and it turns out we see this in several places in the solar system where we have this tidally locked orbit. Okay. Well, another interesting thing I want to bring up here, and that is in the asteroid belt, if you make a graph of the number of asteroids versus distances from the sun, you notice there are certain spots here where you see either no or very few asteroids. So, so uh, uh, these spots with very few asteroids or no asteroids are like gaps in the asteroid belt. Now, now asteroids will cross these gaps, uh, so elliptic orbit across the gap, but I'm talking about semi-major axis. Okay, um, what happened was that an astronomer by the name of Daniel Kirkwood realized that these gaps, remember that we've got p squared equals a cubed, so if you know A, you can solve for P. So he did that, and he realized that the periods were commensurate points with Jupiter's period. Jupiter orbits about every 12 years, and so some of these asteroids orbit, were, it, 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 some, some of these gaps uh, were at half of Jupiter's period, or three-fifths of Jupiter's period, or five-eighths of Jupiter's period, or seven-sixteenths of Jupiter's period, or something. Now, what does this mean? If it's at three-fifths of Jupiter's period, that means when the asteroid goes around five times, Jupiter's gone around exactly three, Exactly, and so it's tugging the asteroid in exactly the same spot in its orbit. Well, that would eventually pull the asteroid out of orbit. And so Kirkwood realized that, and so we call these Kirkwood gaps. Now, the problem is, if you just slightly nudge it out of the orbit, you would actually see a whole bunch of asteroids piled up just barely outside the Kirkwood gaps. Instead, that's not what we see at all. We see just outside the Kirkwood Gap still a de deficit of asteroids, and they're really piled up far between the Kirkwood Gaps. So something else is going on that has to do with Jupiter. That turns out to be uh, something that uh, uh, astronomer uh, Jack Wisdom came up with. And he was actually a physics uh, student who was working on the mathematics of orbits. And I remember when I was in graduate school, he, he had just finished his work here, and he had a computer that he put, you know, like a million asteroids in here and just turned on the solar system and let it go for a long time and calculate what was going to happen year after year after year for those asteroids. What he found was that everything worked along just fine, except that Jupiter's 
nudging, instead of just slightly moving the asteroid, cause the asteroids to suddenly go into wild changes of eccentricity flying all over the solar system. In mathematics, we call this chaos. Okay, so it's not just it's not just randomness. There's actually a mathematical term called chaos, which which constrains exactly how this works. Uh, but he, what he found was it worked perfectly normal for a long time, and then after about half a billion years, it went nuts, and they went flying all over the solar system. And then he also found the smallest ones went first, and the biggest ones went last. Well, when we look at the moon, we see an interesting thing. Okay, so we have all these craters in here. Uh, most of those craters happened when the moon was very, very young. Well, left over from the propylid, left over from all the stuff flying around the solar system. That kind of makes sense. The period of intense bombardment. Well, if you carefully look at the ages of the craters of the moon, though, we find that, yes, there was a period of intense bombardment, but then there was another period of intense bombardment about a half billion years later. And at the end of that period, of a second period of intense bombardment, the really big craters happened that cracked the moon's surface, and then lava came and flowed uh, into these low patches and made these dark markings all over the surface here. And so, so that became what we know as the seas on the moon. Well, it turns out that... The seas are called seas because they're fairly smooth because there have been very few impacts since that time. So that would suggest that we had this period of intense bombardment. Okay, that early bombardment is leftover stuff when the uh, uh, propylid uh, leftover from formation, the solar system stuff flying around. Things are dropping off. Now, theoretically, this should keep dropping off all the way down to nothing. Well, it didn't. Instead, it peaked again about a half billion years after the solar system began. That makes sense if, you, if, if, if Jupiter started clearing out the Kirkwood gaps. And then it dropped off again, but then stays almost steady ever since for the last three and a half billion years. Very little drop off. Well, that doesn't make sense because we should be running out of stuff out there. Why are we not running out of things flying around the solar system? Well, remember the Yarkovsky effect. The asteroids gradually drift around. And they drift too close to the Kirkwood Gap, Jupiter tosses them around. Okay. In fact, even if they're near the edge of the Kirkwood Gap, Jupiter can toss them around. And in fact, some of the ones drift in the Kirkwood Gap, and it takes a half billion years to get tossed around. And so, uh, so that means there's this steady supply of rocks raining down on the inner solar system from the asteroid belt. 